we gathered in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. I sought my God, my God I could not see. I sought my soul, it too eluded me. I sought my neighbour, and I found all three. So that was uh, an anonymous uh, Celtic writing. The uh, talk um, is towards Jerusalem. Our journey is ultimately a journey to Jerusalem. Just as Jesus went up to Jerusalem and up onto the cross, the Lord is trying to guide us towards Jerusalem. Our journey began at conception and ever since we have a sacred purpose and a sacred journey to make in life. As religious we are committed to live our lives in a special way that calls us to be open to transformation. The Lord has a mission in mind for us and as Cardinal John Henry Newman in his prayer reminds us that even though the Lord has a mission for us we may never explicitly know it in this life. However, we cannot just leave it there. We have to work diligently to discover the mission the Lord has for us. It may mean doing something we've never done before or trained for. And one of the great examples, of course, is Jesus turned fishermen who knew all about nets and boats into fearless preachers and teachers. So what does God want me to be transformed into? That requires lots of prayer and contemplation before the Lord. The vow of obedience calls us to collectively listen to God's voice recording the community's mission in the world. How do you receive your call? To be a sacred heart? Did someone call you, invite you, suggest to you, you know, uh, I think you should join a religious order? Often we were influenced by people either asking or recommending us to enter. Some chose the life because they saw it as a fuller form of life. But no matter, we had to take stock of our situation and have the courage to book the common trend of our friends. When we answered our call, we were very much the same position as Abraham. We hadn't a clue what it entailed or how it worked out. So when we took our lives, God made a covenant with us to which he is always faithful. He will always be with us. And like Abraham, we really only have one response to God, trust in God. That's all Abraham could do. When God said, I want you to leave your family, your friends, your land, I want you to go on a journey. And he says, where to? He says, I'll tell you when you get there. And so all Abraham could do was put his trust in God. And that's all we can do, is put our trust in God as he leads us the uh, through our life <clears throat> and in return we have experienced the life we could not have imagined so how do you know what you're called to today when we entered religious life the road map was fairly simple follow the rule and the rule will guide you but the world today is very different and we too are different we are very different from the person who first entered religious life. Our corners have been rounded off by the many compromises and accommodations we have made. We, in our turn, have been called to transform the world by being loving people. Love changes everything for the better. Love is the most potent power in the world. We become loving by being open and willing to cooperate with God. The Sacred Heart is our guide in reaching out to people in a loving way. In the past we worked hard for God and the community, but now it's time to allow God to work in us, to move into a more contemplative way of life. We are called now to abide with God because we have or are moving away from a life of doing. 
Now it's time to reflect on all those lessons we have learned from life and to integrate them into our life. At this stage we have left much behind, years of dedicated service and it's time to mourn and let go of them. Over the years of service we have become attached to a ministry and it is only natural that we feel its loss. It's a kind of bereavement for us and it's appropriate to mourn. At the same time we have to remember that naked we came into the world and naked we will return to God. It is time to lighten our baggage. During our life we have more than filled our bags and now it's time to search through baggage and have a rumble sale. As we look through our baggage we will remember all the butterflies that have swooped into our lives at various stages. As we remember them we most certainly should pray for them but it may also require us to write a letter or to forgive someone because how can we face the forgiving God with unforgiveness burning in our hearts? We will let our unforgiveness live with us for all eternity. If we do not forgive then what does that tell us about how deeply the gospel has penetrated our lives? Now is the time to settle all our relationships and thank those who have been the support for us. And remember, it's later than we think. God is calling us to draw closer and remember that the journey to Jerusalem ends in resurrection, not death. To draw closer we need to let go of old identities and images. We are called to grow in God's love, God's life and God's presence. Now we need to give time to the Lord more and more so that he can grow steadily within us. As Psalm 138 tells us, the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Now is the time for a fuller integration in the Lord. It is a period of transforming. It is time to let God melt us and mould us, as the hymn states. Relax and enjoy the experience, and let the Lord mature us with divine ageing. And so, when we do that, we move into a new rootedness, a way of seeing ourselves as an elder, a shift from doing to being. Here we connect with others in a new way as we continue to transform our lives. We are transcending the crisis and change of doing of a doing life. As we transform, we begin to encounter God in a new way as we abide more and more with him, resisting the transformation into an elder becomes a stumbling block to this stage of divine maturing. It is time to let go of our service life. We can never live that way again. Let go of the glory of youth and its strength. Let us now embrace the glory of contemplation and white hair. Sure, this is painful, but pruning always produces more abundant fruit. Letting go to let live in a more appropriate way to our new status in life. Spirituality always involves a process of becoming, moving toward the person God had in mind for us. It gives us the time to sit down with others and talk about their journey and share our own journey. Our listening to the stories of others we learn that we may have misjudged them and formed unfavorable impressions of them. Now is the time to acknowledge it and develop a closer bond. When we entered this, <clears throat> into, when we entered religious life, this was uh, discouraged and even outlawed in some cases. We did not talk about our families, etc. And so now is the time of discovery. We need to reach out to others and encourage them to tell their stories and we tell ours. When talking with someone, they say, I'm going to tell you something I've never told anyone before. Listen intently if anyone even says that, even if the room is on fire. Otherwise, it might never be said, 
and it is vitally important for that person to speak. Lack of forgiveness can keep a person from dying until they get it off their chest to someone. It torments them until they breathe their last. Always be a willing listener because you do not know how much it benefits the other person, how much they are unloading. Also, it is good to write down our own story and record it. Others will want to read it. We might be surprised at that, but people do. We often get requests from various members of someone's family wanting to know more about their life. So why let someone else write about you? Only you can really write your story. So go and do so. Wouldn't it be sad if the archivist of your community had nothing in the files about you to tell to other relatives? Our relations are a trove of meaning and purposes in our relationship with the Lord. It becomes more real as we age, for as we engage on the spiritual search, aging challenges us to discard many things, including our infile in <coughs> Uh, imagery of God that is part of the inner decluttering that we must do that's very much uh, an in word these days decluttering and so we need to declutter ourselves during our journey at times we felt that we had moved closer to the Lord but then we felt as if we were being pushed away this is because we are trying to to make the Lord fit into our image rather than us accept the, the Lord's uh, terms. The Lord eases away each time until we come back with a better understanding. This ebb and flow in religious life continues throughout life. The author of the cloud of unknowing states quite categorically that in the cloud all our preconceptions of God have no relevance. The inner work is letting go of all the images and the stumbling blocks to accepting God simply as God. The God who loves us to our boots, who is proud of us and loves us through and through. The God we do not have to impress. The God who simply wants to be there to love us and hold our hand. The inner work drives us to be more competitive, com com <clears throat> contemplative, to realize that God loves us for who we are, not what we do. He is the God who draws us to forgiveness, to forgive others and to forgive ourselves. More importantly, to forgive ourselves. And so we're called to journey the road to Jerusalem. And that's a road of conversion. The uh, little word in Mark's gospel, um, it's a throwaway line that most people overlook. Uh, on the way, in Greek, enodo. And the, uh, although it seems very simple, on the way, Jesus taught them, the, um, every time it appears, there's a teaching of Jesus on discipleship. And so it's a very important word. And uh, the, the Gospel of Mark, uh, well, the Synoptic Gospels all change at the uh, question Jesus puts to the disciples at Caesarea Philippi. Who do you say that I am? And from that point, the whole focus of the Gospels change. Jesus has his eyes fixed on Jerusalem and is going to make a journey the, uh, now up to Jerusalem. And on the way to Jerusalem, he teaches them about discipleship. So, the, <clears throat> so on the way is a term that crops up many times in Mark, especially in the section on discipleship, and it refers to the inner journey each disciple must make. Galilee is where the disciples first encountered Jesus and his marvellous dinners and works, and there is certain euphoria about being connected with this great charismatic miracle wonder worker. But this is superficial. Attachment must be deepened <clears throat> and this journey to Jerusalem on the way to the cross deepens that journey. During this journey many of our notions and values will have to be crucified. 
if we are to put on Christ, as Paul would say. The disciples' road starts in Galilee, a euphoric time for them. This is where many start their journey, and like the disciples, they are reluctant to move on. They want to stay in the euphoric state. To move on means journeying through desert and over rough terrain with a modicum of comfort. To remain in Galilee is to remain in a superficial relationship with the Lord, and you will not meet him where it really matters, at the cross. The first thing we notice in this section is that it starts and ends with a miracle of blindness. There's only two blind stories bracket in Mark, and they bracket the material on discipleship. Uh, bracketing is a, is a common um, way that the uh, disciples wrote. Uh, if you look at a manuscript of uh, uh, the, the Gospel, it's just written in Greek. And it's like uh, the lads in the high school here write. No paragraphs, no sentences properly or anything. Uh, they just write. And that's the way the Gospel writers, so they must be imitating Gospel writers. Uh, so <clears throat> that's the way the Gospel writers wrote. They just wrote in capital letters and just brum, brum, brum. They didn't break it up into paragraphs like we do uh, or anything like that. So how do you know which is the start and uh, the end of a section? And so it was usually uh, around a, a place name, um, the, a certain place, a certain uh, thing. Um, it, it starts and ends with the sa same way. And so uh, there's prime examples of it. Like John's Gospel. In John's Gospel, he only mentions Mary twice. Now, the guy who was given charge of Mary at the cross, you'd think he'd me mention her quite, you know, quite often during his Gospel. And he mentions her twice. At the beginning of his ministry at Cana and at the cross. And so, what he's saying by that is that Mary encompasses the whole ministry of Jesus. So uh, then there's the curse of the uh, fig tree. The barren fig tree brackets the cleansing of the temple. And the, um, the barren tree is cursed and Jesus is cursing the temple because both are barren. So the temple, like the fig tree, is fruitless. And what does not dis uh, produce fruit is discarded. So the material on the outside, on the bracket, it's an interpretation of what's in between. And so, the, uh, and so Mark, in his section on discipleship, he begins with the story of a cure of a blind man, and he ends with the story of a blind man. Uh, Jesus in, um, uh, John in uh, his gospel, um, he starts the gospel at Cana, and so Jesus makes the wine, and then he goes and meets three people very quickly. Uh, Nicodemus, a full Jew. The Samaritan woman, half Jew, half pagan. And then the centurion, the Roman figure, who's full pagan. And then he comes back to Cana again, where he uh, raises up the son of the widow. And so that's one section. Starts at Cana, ends at Cana. And that's how they made their paragraphs in those days. And so it's, um, it's a device that was uh, very uh, common at that time. So the, uh, um, the great source of this is uh, Actemeyer's book um, on Mark. The, uh, uh, he details all, the, all this, how they, they used it and that. And so, what is the significance of Mark's bracketing this section on discipleship with the two blind stories? When we look at Mark, we see that despite there being many miracle stories, there are, however, only two uh, about the cure of a blind person. This makes them more significant. So why did Mark reserve these two stories the, um, for discipleship? 
What interpretation did he want us to draw about discipleship and blindness? The blindness stories show that even though the disciples were committed to Christ, they were nevertheless blind in many respects. And so that's a commentary on us too. The, uh, although we might be following the Lord, we are still blind in many respects. They had extreme difficulty in seeing the real Jesus, and this blindness can only be cured by divine help. To see Jesus is a gradual unfolding developmental process. So whilst they were on the way, Jesus was trying to open their eyes to who he was and what he was really about, and to heal their blindness brought about by their culture and popular religion. And this begs the question of us today, what blindness do we have? None of us are immune from the prejudice and bias of the society we were brought up in. We have to make a truly honest assessment of all our values. Today in Mission Theology the question is raised, how do we distill out the essence of the Gospel from the culture in which we received it? What notions from culture and popular religious assumptions do we need to weed out? All disciples have to plod their way to Jerusalem. We can't remain in Galilee all the time. We have to journey to Jerusalem, to be on the way, on the way to the cross, because it is only when we fully understand the cross that we can really understand Jesus. To proclaim Jesus, we first have to understand him as best we can. It will also require divine work to open our eyes. It is a gradual opening, hence the cure requires two attempts. Also, it reminds us that we cannot do it on our own. We need the constant work of the divine active in our lives. As he told uh, Peter, it was not flesh and blood that revealed this to you. So blindness is a symbol of imperfect discipleship. And to cure our blindness, we have to journey, to be on our way to the cross. We see this in imperfection in disciples. Uh, Mark 8, uh, 32. Peter is rebuked after his confession of faith. 9, 5. The misunderstanding of the, at the transfiguration. 9, 32. The misunderstanding of the passion predictions. 10, 32. The disciples are afraid of what Jesus is saying. Imperfection needs to be healed. They need conversion to change their ways and thinking, coupled to take on a new set of values. But it is not easy to hear the words that challenges us, to hear the hard sayings that questions our view of life and values, and ask us to replace our values with a new set of values and concepts. None of that is easy. And sometimes quite painful. That is why it is not good to play scripture roulette with our readings of the Bible. Scripture roulette is when we pick up uh, the Bible and we go oh, and just open it randomly and then we read from there. Because uh, one of the things uh, that happens when we do that is we skip over the passage we find hard and those are the interesting the passages we find hard are the most interesting passages for us. Everyone finds something in the Bible hard. It's not, uh, so, and that section is not hard for everyone, but for, um, for me or for you, it may be a hard saying. And it's grappling with that that we need to do. So the, um, <clears throat> so the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, so would you have chosen Peter if you were in Jesus' shoes? Peter is frequently being slapped down. But one of the things with Peter is he always thinks about it and bounces back with a new understanding. And so that is what we need to do, is to come back to the Lord with a new understanding of him. That is why Jesus chose him to be leader. So are we going to be like Peter and willing to change our attitudes and understanding of Jesus 
as we head towards Jerusalem. If we don't change, we'll never get there. So if someone said that religious life is a radical living of the gospel, we choose to follow the steps the <clears throat> from our companions and to walk with Jesus. So how do we know Jesus? We know him through prayer, through scripture and revelation. The gospels are an important source of our knowledge about Jesus. For it lets us see how he did things what his thinking was, and how he greeted all kinds of people. My moral professor used to say that Jesus opened up new vast vistas in who we could re relate to because he took away all the natural taboos. So what does the Gospels teach us about Jesus? So Matthew, born in Antioch, the Mediterranean seaport, second only to Jerusalem, the place where hundreds of Jews fled during various persecutions and the destruction of Jerusalem and the massacre of the priests by the Romans. Matthew uses the metaphor of the mountain very much in his gospel. We are called to go up the mountain where there is new life. Mountains figure largely in Jewish faith, Sinai, Moriah and others. The, the Sermon on the Mount is given the... Uh, on the mountain and the cross is in a way is on a mount so the Sinai was the giving of the law I will be their God and they will be my people it's the beginning of the Israel the people of God the um, God chose them as his own and so it brings new life Moriah the temple mount the place where Abraham made the covenant with God. The altar was sprinkled with the blood of the animals that were quartered on that day in remembrance of the covenant. And, the, uh, and that is why the altar was sprinkled with blood the, um, uh, to remind of the covenant God made with Abraham. And, the, uh, and what made God choose Abraham? His trust. His trust in God. And Jerusalem was called Jerusalem, the place of peace. The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was acting like Moses, going up a mountain to give a new law for the new covenant that he was about to make. The, uh, and the cross, after Peter's confession, this synoptics change. Their face is set on going to Jerusalem, up to the cross, and up to life with the Father. Mark's Gospel is slightly different. The main metaphor, the sea of suffering. He has a few stories about being uh, on a storm at sea. Written in Rome not long after the persecutions by Emperor Nero, Rome was the hub of the vast Roman Empire and it dominated commerce. It attracted people from all over the known world and many Jews lived there, outside the city on the other side of the river from the patricians. Rome burn, burnt in a seven day fire which totally gutted the city. Someone had to be blamed and the Jewish enclave escaped the fire so they must be to blame. And in consequence, some Jews went to Nero and said it was the Christus Jews that were to blame. And so the soldiers were sent to round up the Christus Jews. Peter got swept up in this and executed. It was a savage persecution. And it's against this sea of suffering that Mark writes his gospel to encourage Christians who were suffering to hold firm to the Lord and he will deliver them safe. Hence the sea, a troubled place with its storms, is the setting for many stories in Mark. Luke, different again. Walking the road. How do we mature in our Christian living? It was written for Greek Christians living in the communities around the Mediterranean. Nero's persecution was spreading out across the empire, but not as aggressive as in Rome. So the question his readers was, 
are we on the right road? Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? For Luke, the right road is the road of compassion. And so he tells the story of the good Samaritan, the prodigal son, etc. Demonstrates the way of compassion, even to their persecutors. Compassion and service is the hallmark of the Christian. And in times of adversity, this really marks out the Christian. Christian Christianity is compassion and service, not a theory. Put off the self-ego for the Christian ego. John, uh, uh, John completely different than the other three. Um, usually, um, if you go into a very old church, uh, they have the pulpit, and it's usually an eagle holding up the books. The eagle represents John, because John's theology soars way above all the others. Uh, it was the last gospel written. He, had, he was a young, young lad when, uh, uh, when he was going around with Jesus, and now he's an old man. He's had lots of time to reflect. It was written late 90s, early 100s, so he's had much time to reflect, and so it's di very different. And so for John, it's resting in the garden, the place of joy. By the time John writes, there are many converts, and they're high on enthusiasm. And so the danger is that they go off and do things on their own, doing great things in their name. And that leads to the trap of feeling righteousness. Look how well we're doing. We are better than you. And so John is warning that they uh, are still immature in their faith and so needed to be grounded more and more ever in the Lord. And so, I am the vine, abide with me. Uh, such phrases uh, litter John's Gospel. And so, and if we do, if we abide in the Lord, this will lead to inner joy, a peace the world cannot give. He calls us into the garden, a place of new creation and life. The resurrection takes place in a garden. And so our journey is from Eden to the new Eden. So the cross opens up the gate to the new Eden that's created for us. So Jesus opens that gate for us the, uh, through his sacrifice on the cross. Where Adam failed, Jesus triumphs. And we should be filled with joy because he is leading us into that new Eden, into that garden of peace and calm. And so the Gospels, the, uh, they show us how to live the, um, our days now. And so, um, so how am I going to live the Gospel at this particular time?